Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang Tamang Sankhang Masami. Uh, when Lumpur Sumato begins a uh, Dhamma talk, uh, as uh, many people are probably familiar, he uh, usually quotes uh, a verse from the Dhammapada rather than doing this uh, a more, um, say, conventional or customary uh, way of beginning things. And the, the, the verse he quotes is one that um, is obviously very uh, special to him and uh, particularly related to this monastery. And it, the, the verse he, he quotes means um, uh, the doors to the deathless are open. Uh, let, let those who can hear uh, act upon or demonstrate their faith. And... Uh, the choice for the name of this monastery, Amravati, and then that verse from the Dhammapada, the, you know, the doors to the deathless are open. This is a principle that uh, he's always found very significant and, and important. Uh, Amravati means the, the deathless realm, the, uh, the place of um, freedom from birth and death. And uh, these, uh, the verses of the Buddha is a statement also just after the Buddha's enlightenment and when he was um, say, asked to teach, invited to teach by the Brahma Sahampati, just as the uh, invitation to give a Dhamma talk this evening was made by Anagarika Meng. This is uh, quoting the, the story, the incident uh, recounted in the scriptures where the Brahma Sahampati uh, uh, appears before the Buddha and asks him to, to teach, to share his understanding for the benefit uh, of all beings. And then the Buddha, being persuaded, then uh, decides to go and find his five former companions living in the, the deer park outside of Varanasi. And uh, this statement, uh, open other doors to the deathless. Uh, let those who are, uh, say, who are able to hear, let those who can understand, uh, demonstrate their faith or act upon the, the faith that they have. Uh, is uh, part of that, that same uh, initiative. Uh, it's okay, well, I'll teach uh, the, the doors to the deathless. Uh, uh, the capacity uh, is there within us. Uh, the, the teaching, the means to understand how to, uh, to enter the deathless realm is there. I, can, I, can under, I understand this myself. I can teach this myself. Therefore, um, uh, I'll act upon that. And then those who can hear, those who can understand, let them act upon that understanding, let them demonstrate their, their faith. Now, for, for many people, when we, uh, particularly in the West, we don't uh, have words like uh, the deathless or the unconditioned, the unborn, unoriginated. These are not normally part of our everyday conversation. Maybe here at Amravati they are. <laughs> uh, but in ordinary everyday circumstances, Words like the deathless, the uh, amata, dhamma, or the unconditioned, the asankata, the, these are not common words. And they can also, in particular, they can sound very vague or abstract, uh, metaphysical. It's not something that's within our ordinary scope of, of thinking, or everyday activity. And so um, even though the, the words like you know, the doors to the deathless are open, um, that can be you know, inspiring or uh, appealing, but uh, when uh, we consider, well, what, what do we mean by the deathless, or what do we mean by uh, nibbana, uh, what do we mean by the unconditioned? These are obviously central principles. These are, are pointing to you know, core qualities uh, that uh, the, the practice of, uh, of Buddha Dhamma are are addressing, they're aimed towards uh, supporting, enabling the, the realization of these qualities. But it can also seem very vague or distant, that the, the unconditioned, maybe, maybe there's a, a, 
an inspiring quality, uh, like a, an aura of, of attraction and, and interest or inspiration around that, but can, it can also be seen as something that's very vague or it's kind of over there or it's some other, uh, some other realm far across the other side of the, of the cosmos. Uh, and particularly if we read these teachings of the Buddha, like in, in the... Uh, um, in the Udana, the, the, uh, where the Buddha gives that teaching uh, on uh, the unconditioned that we recite here, there is the unborn, the, un, uh, the unformed, the uncreated, the unconditioned. And if there were not, then there would uh, be no freedom possible from the born, the created, the formed, and the conditioned. But because there is the unborn, the unoriginated, the unformed, the unconditioned, then freedom is possible from the born, the created, the conditioned, and the formed. There's a so there's a, another teaching in that same group, uh, chapter eight of the uh, Udana, where the the Buddha says, you know, there is that ayatana, that sphere of being, that that realm, where um, there is uh, no, there is no birth and death, there is no coming, no going, no standing still, there is neither no sun, no moon, no stars, uh, no uh, uh, no basis, no support. And uh, he said, and this, uh, this I declare, this is the end of all dukkha. This, uh, this ayatana, this sphere of being, this, this quality is synonymous with the ending of all dukkha. So we can hear that and it can sound kind of uh, appealing in some ways, but also can be kind of vague or, or sort of so slightly threatening. Oh, no sun, no, no moon, no stars, <laughs> no, no place to stand, no coming, no going, no standing still. And it can feel... Uh, some, like some kind of strange, mysterious, uh, formless, uh, undefined realm off there, over some other place, and uh, something that is uh, intangible, remote, distant. So in, in reflecting upon these qualities, and I'll, uh, I've done this quite a bit since uh, Ajahn Pasana and I spent 10 years writing a book about it, <laughs> the... Uh, the, these teachings, the, far from being pointing towards something that is, is vague or remote or um, intangible even, it, uh, it's helpful to consider, to, to reflect that these, are, uh, these, are, uh, these teachings are not pointing about anything that's far away from us. It's not talking about some other mysterious sort of super heaven or some kind of uh, mysterious dimension that you, you have to, to get the a, a kind of hundred-digit password to get into, or some special magical key to to unlock, but it, it's uh, talking about the, the very fabric of your own life, your own mind, your own heart. You know, this is not something that's outside of of us. Uh, it's not some quality that's outside of you. It's uh, it's not elsewhere. It's absolutely here, uh, and as it says. Uh, in uh, other spiritual teachings, it's closer to the, closer to you than you are to yourself. Uh, so uh, uh, I feel it's important to bring that that to mind, to to consider that, to to uh, say uh, pick up those terms uh, like the unconditioned or the deathless, and to uh, to s- really take that to heart. That well, this is talking about some aspect of of me, of my life, my mind, my, my nature, that's already here, that's never been separate, that could not be somewhere else. But it, it's here, but it's, uh, it's a quality that we're just not, not noticing. Now, uh, it's something, uh, you know, we, uh, even though uh, the concept or the quality of the, the, the deathless, the unborn, unoriginated, it might sound intangible or... or um, Something that we uh, can't get a hold of, but you know, in our everyday life, we're we're also dealing with similar things. We we uh, uh, say uh, can uh, all relate to the fact that um, that light exists, right? That we we uh, we see light exists. Light comes from the sun, from the electric lamps, from candles, and and we see. But uh, so light has uh, has color. It has form. Uh, it has. Uh, uh, very visible and, and uh, apparent qualities, but also you, uh, you can see you know, light has no uh, no substance. It has no mass. It doesn't weigh anything. Uh, it's uh, 
and that that kind of uh, mysterious fact that yes, it exists, and yes, it's it's uh, very apparent, but it weighs it has absolutely no mass. It has no physical substance. We're quite happy with that, aren't we? It's kind of normal. So, well, of course, light doesn't weigh anything. Duh. You know, everybody knows that. <laughs> but if you think about it, it's kind of mysterious. Uh, and so that uh, I'd, I'd suggest that in exactly the same way, the, the quality of the deathless or the unconditioned, it not only doesn't have any mass, <laughs> it doesn't have any form either, but it also does have qualities. It has uh, very apparent and also discernible uh, qualities that uh, are uh, in a way familiar to us, but we, we often uh, miss it. We don't, we don't recognize that. It doesn't because those qualities don't grab our attention, or we don't, um, say, uh, relate to them in, in, that, uh, in that way of, of uh, say, a, a direct realization, or, or fully, uh, fully knowing, fully understanding you know, what, uh, what these qualities are and what they imply. Oh, uh, we um, uh, just had this, uh, the little ceremony of uh, the uh, lay community determining the eight precepts. And uh, one of the, the teachings that I find extremely helpful and profound that the, the Buddha gave is a, a, a short sutta um, in, the, uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya where he, he talks about uh, the, the reasons, uh, the way that he formulated the eight precepts as a standard of, of conduct. Uh, so he established, he uh, invented the eight precepts as a training structure, as a pattern of training for the lay community to use on the, the lunar days, particularly as a form so that, that um, uh, just like other spiritual groups had a way of, of uh, having a special day once a week, you know, the Buddha considered, well, uh, what can we use? What kind of form or structure might the, uh, the lay community take on as a, uh, a particular observance once a week on the, on the full moon, the new moon, and the, the two half moon days. And then in considering that, uh, he, uh, uh, he came up with the form of the eight precepts. And uh, the origin of it, I find, is, is very significant, very important, because we might think of the precepts as all about you know you can't you're not allowed to kill things you're not allowed to steal things you're not allowed to engage in sexual activity you're not allowed to to lie or use you know, harmful speech and use intoxicants and you know, wear jewelry or perfumes and you're not allowed to to um, you know, seek entertainment and so on eat in the uh, afternoon or the evening it's all kind of don't do this don't do that you know no fun no games you know, no uh, uh, no fooling around. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. So when we look at it on paper, it can seem like a whole collection of, of prohibitions and, and limitations. But when you, you look at this particular teaching of, of the, the Buddha, it's called the Upposita Sutta. Upposita is the word for the observance days. Yeah, he says, uh, and he's just reflecting internally. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those rare suttas where he's, he's not talking to anybody. He's just uh, uh, reflecting within uh, his own mind. And uh, he says to himself, uh, wouldn't it be a useful thing if you know, one day a week the, the lay community, those who are committed to the, the teaching and to the practice, if they refrained from uh, killing living beings, from taking the life of, of breathing things, panatipata. And in that way, they will live as the arahants do. They will live as the enlightened beings do. And that will be for their long-lasting welfare and happiness. So similarly, you know, all their lives, arahants do not uh, take what is not given. They don't engage in sexual activity. They don't uh, use uh, uh, false speech. They don't lie, uh, and so on and so forth. That the uh, so this is the natural disposition of the arahant. Um, this is uh, you know, from the time of their enlightenment uh, to uh, to the end of their life. An arahant will, will never tell a lie. They'll never be uh, uh, consuming intoxicants. They never seek out dis distraction or decoration uh, adornment. Uh, it's just not their inclination. They're not interested in that. that that's their, their say, uh, innate um, uh, pre predisposition or what they're, what they're inclined towards. They, they, they don't seek distraction. They don't seek to, to attract others or to just... Uh, 
uh, amuse themselves or just to uh, to be um, consuming uh, food or, uh, you know, all th- through the day and the evening, but they are happy to to limit the the intake of food just to the the uh, one part of the day. So what he's doing, he's describing this is the 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 uh, the, the way that the the enlightened mind is uh, is inclined. If the heart is t- completely free of greed, hate, and, de- and delusion, it's completely unable to tell a lie. There's no attraction towards uh, uh, towards harming or to to take. The, it's impossible to take the life of another being. Your innate respect for the life and feelings of other beings it rises up, and, and it's impossible to to hurt, to kill another being. There's no interest in, in sexual activity. That if the the mind is completely free of, of delusion and greed and hatred, then sexual uh, desire just f- falls away. There's no interest, no uh, draw to relate to another being in a in a sexual way. That just is 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 not there. Just like uh, offering a horse a hamburger. You know, horses are vegetarian; <laughs> they don't eat meat. So if you if you offer a horse uh, some meat, you put a horse, a hamburger in front of a horse's nose, it'll go, it'll sniff it and it'll just recoil. A hundred percent of horses all around the world, I guarantee. <laughs> because it's just uh, that they, uh, they uh, are not interested in, in eating meat. It's not food for them. There's no, there's no uh, draw there. It's, it's something that is, I say, not interesting. So similarly, the Buddha is pointing to the, this. This is the natural disposition of the, of the liberated mind, of the, the enlightened mind. is uh, It's not interested in, in uh, intoxication, in just uh, distracting the mind by distorting consciousness. It's not interested in just uh, uh, consuming food just for the sake of, uh, of amusement and distraction or just uh, uh, filling in the... You know, the um, Different parts of the day, just with with flavors and tastes and and uh, the activity of eating, but uh, relates to eating uh, in a, a far more pragmatic, straightforward, uh, simple, and, and natural way. That you, like, you don't just go and visit. If you drive a car, you don't just visit several pet- petrol stations, you know, a few times a day, just because you, you like stopping at petrol stations and filling the tank. <laughs> it's like, why would you do that? Why bother? You just fill up the tank with with the petrol that you need, and then you drive on. And then when the when the tank gets empty, then you fill her up again. So, so this is how we uh, so the the enlightened mind relates to the the act of eating. You just you know, fill up when you need to uh, fill up once a day, and then the rest of the time you don't need to think about it. You don't just pull into to um, petrol stations to for the for the thrill of ha- you know, having more petrol put in your tank. <laughs> so similarly, uh, so this is the way that uh, I mean he didn't use those, that analogy, <laughs> but uh, just. Transliterating into a modern idiom, so I feel this is very important to understand that, that when we the, the, we look at the eight precepts, he's saying if the heart is completely free, is totally liberated, then this is its natural disposition. It's incapable of violence. It's incapable of of uh, say acquisitiveness, just getting um, something or taking things that belong to someone else. It's just like a, offering a, a horse a hamburger. It's just what? How could I possibly be interested in taking something that's not mine? I mean, it's, it's somebody else's property. You know, how could you possibly help yourself or take something that's that's not offered for you? It's not it's not your space. It's not your things. It's not it's not your option. So what this is pointing to is rather the, the, rather than the eight precepts being a uh, a set of uh, of limitations as so of don't do, don't do this don't do that don't do the other of uh, don't 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 uh, it's more uh, an expression of the heart that is is fully uh, actualized is fully realized the 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 heart that is totally free of neediness the heart that is completely independent that doesn't need anything that is completely Say, uh, self-reliant and and free. That it's not hungering for anything. It doesn't require anything in order for it to be happy or content or or peaceful. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not lacking anything whatsoever. It's uh, uh, in the Pali Puna. It's it's uh, replete. There's a quality of plenitude, of fullness. That there's uh, 
like the the name Puna uh, Puna Puna Dhammo, you know, the, that uh, it's like the uh, the heart filled with with Dhamma. So when we talk about the quality of the, the deathless or, or the unconditioned, uh, the unborn, the uncreated, it's talking about, it's, th- these are, are um, adjectives, they're descriptive words that are pointing to this uh, dimension of our being, this, this, um, base, uh, this basic quality of our own being, which is already complete and full and, and liberated, which is completely content, that doesn't need anything. And so that, uh, uh, just as the, the Buddha says in that little sutta, the Upposita Sutta, you know, if you um, if you act in this way, if you refrain from taking life or refrain from taking what is not given, if you, you know, refrain from sexual activity and uh, yeah, eating in the uh, in the inappropriate times and so on, then you are acting as the arahants do. You're you're drawing upon that dimension of your own being, which is. Uh, already uh, liberated and already uh, awake, that is, uh, free of confusion, free of self-centeredness, you know, free of, of limitation. And, and it's not like that, is, that quality is somewhere else and you've got to get it. Like the, sort of the enlightened mind is, <laughs> is over there, again, on the, sort of the other side of the cosmos, or, in some, uh, or is possessed by some kind of great master and you've got to go and get it off, and get it off somebody else to receive it from the guru. But uh, it's it's here. It's the very basis, the, the very fabric of your own mind. That that uh, that uh, quality of dhamma. I mean, you know, the the uh, dhamma is uh, that is the refuge. Is the is this very quality, this very attribute uh, of your own being, your own mind. That's, that's already here, and you can't get away from it. You can't lose it, or you can't not have it, because you might. Uh, you might be thinking, as he, he, uh, as one hears these words, that oh well, it's uh, it's all very well to talk about the, the, um, the everyone has the unborn, the unconditioned, the uncreated uh, has the deathless as part of their mind. But you know, I got missed out <laughs> when I, when they when I came off the assembly line, they they missed that bit out because there's definitely nothing in me that's liberated or pure or, or uh, independent. Yeah. But. Uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, you know this is just the, the the habits of thinking, the the usual condition patterns of self-critical thinking. Let's say uh, you know that I'm no good, or I'm complete, or I've got a bit missing, or I'm not quite right, or I've got something that's that's uh, fundamentally broken and, and wrong and uh, and uh, uh, and weak, or, or not quite perfect, not quite pure, not uh, not good enough. Uh, but I would suggest that that, uh, that, that is uh, just the, the habits of thinking that have, are very powerful and very, can be very pervasive, can be very convincing, but they're, they're just uh, habits of thinking. Uh, they're the habits of self-view that continually uh, distort and, uh, and affect our, our way of seeing. And when we talk about taking refuge in the Triple Gem, taking refuge in Dhamma, uh, this is, uh, in, in a sense, trying to change our vision of who and what we are. So rather than thinking, you know, I am this body, I am this personality, I am a man, I am English, I am a woman, you know, I'm, I'm French or I'm Thai, you know, I'm old, I'm young, I'm a layperson, I'm a monastic. All of those I am's that have a conventional reality on the, in the everyday world, what uh, these, these teachings are pointing to is that Yes, that's true. This you can say this is a male body, or that, yes, I was born in England, and yes, you know, I wear a robe, and I went through a, a ordination ceremony thirty, four, thirty five years ago. But there's also that dimension. If we look within, if we, if we uh, say, examine the the mind, explore and reflect upon the nature of mind. Yeah, so in the meditation and, and through uh, the process of our daily experience, we, there's a, an exploring, an investigation. We'll see that there's a qualities of our mind that, to which age does not apply. Yeah. Awareness, a quality of knowing, is not old or young. The, uh, awareness itself is not female or male. You don't get monastic awareness or lay awareness. You, know, you don't get... Uh, you know, Three weeks ago or a month ago, uh, Venerable 
Tejumedi and uh, Ruchiro, they they weren't kind of, and they didn't have kind of uh, white awareness. And now they have brown awareness. <laughs> you know, the 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 name Tejumedi or Ruchiro, they they uh, they didn't have those two months ago. Now they have them. The, the name is additional. It, the quality of awareness, the quality of knowing, is is independent of the names, of the forms, of the structures. So, and again, I can I can say these words, and and uh, uh, we can understand the the meaning of them, or the in terms of the language. But it's important to to if to the extent that we can to take that in and to to explore for ourselves. I say, oh yeah, I think of myself as a woman or as a man. I think of myself as old or young or being uh, this this nationality or this character type but the fact is you know when when uh, you look uh, and it, we experience uh, that quality of knowing then we can see for ourselves just like the the breath that comes into the body you know, it's not male breath or, or female breath it's not english oxygen or <laughs> french or sri lankan oxygen it's just oxygen you know the light that the eye sees it, it, uh, it's just light. It's not male light or female light. It's not old or young. It's just light. Uh, similarly, uh, it just as the, 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 the oxygen and uh, nitrogen and uh, hydrogen, carbon, phosphorus and sulfur and everything that makes up our physical bodies, these are not, uh, these are not bound by name. This is not kind of, I don't have my, my bones made of amaro carbon. <laughs> don't have a little kind of a squared mark all the way through my carbon atoms <laughs> around the protons and neutrons electrons all the quarks that make up our the physical matter of our body these are not male or female they're not old or young they're not uh, sri lankan or thai or english or french or hungarian or german Oh, when we we uh, look at the, these qualities, and we begin to see that uh, the the, you know, the habits of self view are very strong. The, the I am the body, I am the personality. Those have a strength; they have a power. But also, when they're explored, when we, when we pick those up and look, uh, at those those habits, we see well. These are just uh, say ways of of thinking, ways of naming things, and and. Uh, Labeling ourselves, that uh, you know, it's just one way of looking at it, and that that way of looking can be changed. Things can be seen in a in a different way, and that capacity to revision who and what we are, to see things in a different way, that is the liberating agent. That capacity to let go of self view, to let go of conventional truths, to let go of the names that we have and the labels that we put on things. Uh, this this capacity to revision, to see things differently, that's how the 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 path is really entered. And the the Buddha described you know these as the uh, the initial fetters, the first of the things that really bind the heart to the cycles of, of birth and death, is self view, sakaya ditti, the 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 unconscious belief that I am the body, I am the personality. The attachment to conventions of uh, of society. This is good. That's bad. This is beautiful. That's ugly. This is this is valuable. This is not valuable. This is a sacred ritual, and this is just a, a body function. These ways of naming and labeling things. That when those are revisioned, when we see, well, this is you know, a name is just a name. Like Tejumedi didn't know his name a month ago. <laughs> now he's. Got it memorized. It's told to all, all sorts of people. We we don't, we don't say Neil anymore. We say Teja Uh But where did that come from? <laughs> it's just a name. Yeah, it's a it's a very I think it's a very fine name myself. One who is uh, 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 possessed of keen wisdom. Uh, but it's a name. It came out of nowhere. It came out of the blue, and now that's the name that's used. So just in the same we, uh, same way that we say English or. British, or we say French, or we, uh, we say Croatian rather than Yugoslavian. <laughs> to to revision who and what we are, this is the the, the purpose of insight meditation. The, the purpose of 
learning to look at thought, to look at mental formations, the, the habits of, of thinking, of naming, of, of seeing, and to, to draw upon our capacity to, to let go, to, to, uh, to drop our habitual attachments and, and perceptions, and to think, well, hang on a minute, let's have a look. What, what is real here? What's true? So insight meditation, vipassana, is all about revisioning. It's about seeing things in a different way, letting go of the habits of perception. You know, I am this person, you know, these are my things, those are, these are good, this is bad, this is mine, that's yours. And it's that, uh, it's that uh, say, uh, capacity to broaden the, the vision, to broaden the view, the, the, that in us which can say, well, hang on a minute, let's, let's look more closely, let's, let's explore. And then when that exploration happens, when there is that Dhamma Vijaya, that investigation, that uh, wise reflection, then uh, just like opening up a, a box, opening up a, you know, a, a bag full of things and exploring what's inside, then once we've opened the, the box, looked inside the bag and, and started to take out some of the things that are there, then, then we see things differently. We know what's inside. We, we see more clearly how it works. Now, in the, uh, again, going back to the, the words like the, the deathless or the unborn, the unconditioned, again, these can seem very remote or distant or, or vague. But I feel very grateful for the, the teachings that uh, Lumpur Sumedho, Lumpur Cha would, would give. And particularly uh, uh, helpful, I find, how that uh, they would point to the, the fact that the experience of, of the unconditioned or the deathless, even though it might sound very you know, dramatic, you know, the deathless, da da, you know, kind of cue, the, the cue trumpets and <laughs> drums and uh, can sound dramatic, melodramatic, um, that uh, it's, uh, uh, I say, I'd say it's mistaking things to assume that just because these words are unusual or they can sound a bit grand, that the experience of the, the unborn, the, un the unconditioned, the uncreated, uh, uh, don't expect that, that uh, experience or that realization to be accompanied by the sound of trumpets or kettle drums, you know, that, uh, it's not anything particularly, uh, uh, say, uh, announced in a dramatic way. But more, uh, and, and this I, I found the extraordinarily helpful teaching that, you know, that uh, Ajahn Chah in, in particular would, would emphasize, you know, he, would, uh, he would say that you know, when the mind is free of clinging, when there is um, the, the absence of grasping, and he said, you know, this is Nibbana. When he was asked for you know, how he would define Nibbana, he said, when he would say, Lumpur, what is Nibbana? What is perfect peacefulness? Uh, the way he defined it is to say, Nibbana is the reality of non-grasping. Nibbana is the reality of non-grasping. And, and in the suttas, uh, a phrase that uh, I'm very fond of is, uh, in a... Uh, it, a venerable Sariputta uses in a conversation between him and uh, Ananda. He says, uh, "Bhava nirodho nibbanang," the uh, the ending of bhava of becoming is nibbana. When the becoming stops, then that is the experience of nibbana. So, in, in, in this instance, you can think you know, grasping and becoming are pretty much synonymous. Uh, either you know, upadana, uh, grasping, or um, bhava becoming. In this in this instance, I'd say that yeah, you can uh, use them interchangeably. But again, that can sound like some sort of dramatic event, like some sort of uh, Armageddon, you know, sort of grand, sort of spectacular fireworks show at the end of time. The uh, uh, you know the the cessation of becoming, Bhava Nirodo, like some kind of grand uh, universe-ending event. But uh, what uh, the the uh, the teachings of, of Lumpur Sumedho and Lumpur Cha would would point to over and over again, it's like it's not something that's a, a grand event at the end of your life or, or some sort of spectacular Shazam moment. But in this moment, when the mind lets go, 
when you see that there is a grasping, grasping at a thought, grasping at a, a sensation in the body, grasping at a doubt, yeah, the, the, the mind believing in this desire, I've got to have this or I can't stand that, uh, grasping an anxiety of, oh, I don't know what to do. So when, that, when grasping it is seen and, and it is recognized, and there's a, the recognition of this is grasping, this is the, the mind in a state of, of attachment, of caught up in becoming, in being something, in, in holding on. When that grasping is recognized, and then when it's let go of, when there is the, um, as it, uh, in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, the, the uh, pahinanti, when that, the, there is pahana, there's letting go, there's relinquishment, when it, the things have been abandoned, then right there, you know, there is the experience of the deathless. And uh, I- I- again, in, in Lumpur Cha's own words, so you know, when, the, when the, the, the deathless reality, the Dhamma is experienced, that manifests in the mind as uh, um, the uh, qualities of purity, uh, of uh, radiance, brightness, and peacefulness. There's a quality of peace, a simplicity, a purity, and a, and a brightness. That's the you know, the 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 innate present quality that's here that can be recognized whenever the grasping stops. So it's not some kind of uh, Armageddon, some kind of grand, fantastic event at the end of the universe. But well, you, know, you could say it is, but <laughs> very small universes of the. Uh, the uh, the uni- uh, when the, the the mind is locked on to some thought, a feeling of struggling against a pain in your knee, or or uh, trying to uh, um, hold on to a beautiful memory, or or uh, say uh, caught up in a in a worry about some some job that you're doing, whether it's going to work or not. That moment of recognizing, oh, there's grasping going on. Let go. And then when the, the grasping stops, then if, if we pay attention, whenever the grasping stops, whether it's a distracted thought, it's a feeling in the body, whatever it might be, every single time that the grasping ends, what is present is a, a quality of spaciousness, simplicity. There's a quality of, of, of alertness. The mind is bright and alert, uh, knowing. And a quality of peacefulness, and, and no sense of self. Uh, in that moment, there's no me who's the experiencer. It's not my mind, not my experience. Or oh, look, I'm I'm having an experience of the deathless. <laughs> that that kind of thought can sort of jump in and, and grab the attention. But in the the moment the, of the actuality of non-grasping, uh, the heart free from grasping, then. What is present is is extraordinarily simple. It's not a, a kind of grand firework show. <laughs> it's a a a, 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 a living, a vibrant, energetic peacefulness, a spaciousness, and a perfect simplicity. And nothing is missing. Nothing needs to be got. Nothing needs to be identified with. There's a that quality of punna of fullness, completeness, is is obvious. Nothing is needed. So in that moment when the, the grasping has stopped, then violence is impossible. There's no inclination to 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 hurt anything or take anything or no interest in in uh, sexual gratification. No uh, no possibility of of deceiving or or, uh, t- uh, or or inclination towards distraction. It's not appealing, not attractive. So that uh, these, these, this quality of the deathless is, uh, is right here and is uh, uh, easily, <laughs> quote unquote, <laughs> uh, is easily uh, realized, recognized. It's, it's only a, a moment away if the grasping stops. But the habits of, of grasping are so uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, uh, so potent, that uh, we, we don't notice that. That even when we let go, we can be so busy sort of doing our practice, 
that even though we let go of a thought, we can be so busy doing our insight, doing our vipassana, doing our concentration, doing my meditation, that we don't notice that the, the, the peace and clarity and that quality of fullness is there because it doesn't grab our attention. And again, as Lumpur Samedha would often say, you know, peace is not interesting. Peace does not grab our attention. Uh, and uh, he, would, he would say how uh, you, you never get a newspaper head that, headline that says you know, Ajahn Samedha had a mindful inhalation. Yeah, Ajahn Sumedho's uh, run off with the cook, maybe. <laughs> uh, Eloped to the Bahamas with all the funds from the English Sangha Trust, yeah, that would get the front page. Certainly at the monastery newsletter. <laughs> but you know, Ajahn Sumedho breathed out and then breathed in again. It's like, well, that's not news. That's not interesting. So, uh, and again, how... Uh, uh, how Lumpur would would encourage the development of this, he would point to the the third noble truth. And the uh, if you look in the Dhammachaka Sutta, the, the Buddha's first discourse, when it's talking about the the development of each of the four noble truths, it's if, uh, say that with the second noble truth, the, the truth of uh, tanha of craving being the um, uh, the arising, the cause of, of dukkha. Dukkha niroda, the cessation of dukkha. So in tanha, it needs to be let go of. Bahata banti, it needs to be abandoned or relinquished. Dukkha niroda, the cessation of dukkha, needs to be realized. And, and again, many many of us have heard this over and over again. I've, you know, I've heard it myself. I've, I've explained it myself and talked about it endlessly. And many of us have heard it over and over. And when we hear the words, we go, oh, yeah, right. Dukkha niroda needs to be realized. Okay, yeah, 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 got it. <laughs> but how difficult it is to remember to do that. Because what, what that means is that when, say, we've let go of something, you know, the mind is caught up in a thought or a fantasy or a memory or an irritation or a worry. And then that that caught upness, that attachment is recognized, and they say, oh yeah, I'm really you know, stuck on this memory, or I'm really you know, worried about this this uh, conflict, or I'm really uh, uh, filled with this this uh, particular desire. And then recognizing that, letting go, then there's an initial relief, like ha, ah. like when the, if you're in a a place where the refrigerator is is humming, the fridge is humming away, and then the the, the thermostat on the fridge switches off and then the fridge goes quiet. You go, oh, well, that's nice. I hadn't even noticed there was a noise going on. I didn't recognize there was a buzz happening in the background, but oh, it's nice that it switched off. But then that pleasantness is only appealing for a few seconds. Yeah. I mean, we probably all noticed this, how, oh, that's nice, it's gone quiet. Ah. Okay, so what else is going on around here? <laughs> what else is happening? What else is there to do? Uh, within about three seconds, three to four seconds, if you time it, <laughs> the mind starts to hunt for the next interesting thing. And it can be, so that ending of dukkha, even if it's just a mild irritation, like the, the humming of a, of a fridge, or uh, something as mild and benign as that, the, the mind starts to look for the next interesting thing because that contrast was noticeable. There was an irritation, there was a, a, a stress, and then it stopped. So the stopping was noticeable. But then, uh, the, so the change catches our attention. If there isn't a change, then our attention is not caught. So what, when uh, Lumpur Sumedho said, you know, peace is not interesting, what that points to is that we have to work to sustain the interest in in peace, in space, in silence. That uh, it won't catch our attention. It won't sort of draw the eye. Oh look, <laughs> there's there's a there's a gap between these two people. Oh look, you know there's a uh, a, a silence between these words. Yeah. Oh, oh look, there's a, there's a pause. A space, a gap, a space that is uh, is here. It doesn't catch our attention. So when in the the, the Buddha's explanation, 
about the, the way to work with the, the, the third noble truth, the truth of cessation, Dukkha Niroda needs to be realized, Satchikata Bhanti. It needs to be seen, to be true, to be real. To, its presence needs to be uh, awakened to, Satchikata Bhanti. It needs to be made real. Satcha means true or real. It needs to be made real. So when the, the letting go happens, then we can feel that sense of relief, like, ah, oh, letting go of a, of a doubt, letting go of a, of a, a memory, letting go of a, a craving. Ah. So it's the, the skill that, that we need to develop is to sustain the attention on that space when it's no longer a contrast to anything. To, in a way, look at the gap between people, to notice the space between words, to, to uh, listen to the silence, behind the sound, between the, between the words, to notice a space, to pay attention to that, to, uh, to apprehend and appreciate the, uh, the quality of space. So that takes an effort, that, that is, that's work. But if we, uh, if we do apply that, that amount of effort, uh, then rather than that space just being appealing because it's a contrast to the, the, the buzz of the fridge or the, the, uh, the tension of the desire or the regret or the, the worry or the, um, the activity, there, rather than that space just being a kind of a blank nothing, um, let's say, uh, registered just as being appealing because it's a, it's a sort of relief from the stress, when we bring attention onto to space, to silence, to, to the gap, then there's a mysterious way that, that that silence, that spaciousness, comes alive. In a way, we, the more that that uh, quality of niroda, cessation, uh, the, the non-arising of things, when something has come to an end, uh, the more that we are able to hold our attention on that spaciousness, that space, that uh, openness comes alive. There's a, a, a richness, a, a liveliness that is, in a way, it's what happens when the Dhamma, the, the fundamental reality of, of the present moment, is awakened to. It's always here. <laughs> that uh, fills the space of this, this moment, that uh, resonates through the silence uh, of this moment. It's always here, but we don't notice it because it, uh, it, it doesn't have a form, it doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a, uh, a sound or a structure. So we miss it. Just like the force of gravity, just like light. You know, you can say, well, gravity is here, you can't even see it, <laughs> but we feel its effect. We know it. You know, we can feel the weight of our of our body on the cushion, just like light. You know, gravity has a presence, it has a power, but it's intangible. It has no form, no structure, but it's here. So similarly, the the, the dhamma, the presence of that fundamental reality of our own being, that purity, radiance, peacefulness, is always here. It's uh, ever present, just like uh, the force of gravity. And just like when I say, you know, we're all experiencing the force of gravity, then maybe you hear those words and you go, oh yeah, right. <laughs> but because gravity is not news, you know, the, the earth keeps pulling us to it every day in the same way. We don't feel a different weight each day. <laughs> you know, the, the earth pulls us in the same, uh, with the same strength all the time. Therefore, it's not news. But if we bring our attention to it, we go, oh yeah, right, I can feel the, the pressure of the body held to the, the earth. Yeah, it feels like this. Then we notice it because our attention is brought to it. So, oh yeah, of course, it's a strong force, right? I feel the, the weight of the body. And if, if we were, were off the planet, we're in space, then we would be floating. We would have no weight. Uh, but because of being on the planet, we experience that. So when we are, say, bringing our attention to... Um, uh, to that space, when the, there's a letting go, if we uh, if we want the the quality of the deathless not to just be some sort of remote metaphysical idea that is kind of inspiring, but we think is somewhere far away, all we have to do is to develop the skill of paying attention uh, to the the heart when it is free of grasping. When the letting go happens. 
then to then we we need to awaken to what is present when the mind has stopped grasping and then when the the hunt begins of like oh what's the next interesting thing or or, or the mind starts to get excited oh this is great this is fantastic i i now i understand <laughs> here it is i can feel it wow this is great and then suddenly we want to write a poem about it or tell our friends about it or <laughs> come up with a perfect word for it then uh, the the uh, the mind's uh, urge to to create and to become has waded back in has flowed back into the picture and that spaciousness is no longer apparent it's uh, uh, the mind is again caught up grasping becoming so the the, the task the, the work of meditation is, is a lot to do in terms of of realizing the deathless awakening to the deathless to the unconditioned is sustaining that openness not allowing the mind to get drawn into that that hunt for the next thing the the uh, you know the promise of what we're going to get or or um, what we want to make out of this moment but continually uh, op- o- opening and uh, letting go uh, of every urge that arises for the mind to to be something to get something to have something to do something <laughs> to keep uh, relinquishing that and just letting that uh, that quality of openness, that quality of, of uh, unbiased uh, knowing, un, uh, undistorted uh, awakened awareness to receive and to know the, the quality of each moment. And then you know, the, the deathless will, will continually be apparent, that will, will be an informing presence in the, the background of of our uh, our experience moment by moment day by day so the doors to the deathless are open <laughs> the, the the doors to the deathless are open and they they're right here they're right there with, within all of us uh, this moment and uh, the, the doors are open. You don't have to wait for the doors to open. <laughs> the doors to the deathless are open. You know, these teachings point directly to this. And uh, and as the Buddha said, let let those who can hear, let, let those who hear, ye soto wantu, let those who can hear this, if this is meaningful, if this touches something that uh, in the heart is, oh yeah, right. Then... Act upon that faith. Uh, let that let that faith inform the way that you you operate, and then you uh, you yourselves will be the the uh, the beneficiaries. You know, each one of us will be the the uh, uh, the one who receives the results of that, uh, receives the benefits of that that quality of of peace, uh, of freedom, of clarity, of of uh, of wholeness. Of fullness, and that—that's the the natural result of that that realization, that awakening to this quality of our own being, the the dhamma that is the very fabric of of our of our nature, the nature of all things, the very ground of of the body and mind, the physical, mental, spiritual universe is the is the dhamma itself, is nature itself. So uh, the doors to the deathless are open, and then uh, if if they are uh, uh, if they are entered, if we act upon that that faith, then uh, then we are the, the the ones who benefit from that. But then that also becomes a, a blessing for all those that we live with, because that again that that realization again you might be well awakened to the deathless. I've got things to do. You know, I can't walk around being. Kind of Full of the deathless, I've got, <laughs> I've got letters to write, I've got meetings to go to, I've got places I have to travel, I've got food to cook, I've got... Yeah. It, uh, it's important to recognize that, that even though it might be grand and, and slightly dramatic language, um, being awake to the deathless, it doesn't mean that we can't walk down the, the pathway, it doesn't mean we can't sort of put our, our 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 clothes on or or walk in a straight line 
It's not something that is divorcing us from practical everyday reality, but rather it's it's that quality that helps us attune most completely, moment by moment, to the everyday reality. Uh, that that realization, that wakefulness, is what helps us to to recognize what's the right thing to say, what's the wrong thing to say, what's going to be helpful, what's pertinent, what's useful for uh, for this situation and the work that I'm doing. You know, do I push? Do I hold back? Do I uh, do I do I speak? Do I stay quiet? That that the these uh, quali- this quality these words are, are pointing to a, a a simple natural capacity to attune to be in harmony with things, and so it, that this kind of awareness, this kind of mindfulness, is not getting in the way of practicalities. <laughs> it's, uh, it, rather, it's embodying. The best way of being practical is embodying the the way of fitting in with the, the time, the place, the situation, and and all the things that uh, we need to do to carry out the the um, responsibilities we have and to to fulfil the uh, the karma that is already set in in motion in terms of our life and who, who we are and things that we have uh, as a uh, undertaken. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening.